And uh, now we will uh, open up Matthew 12. Uh, we'll be reading verses 29 to 32, or I will. All right. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven, people, but the blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven. And whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven, either in this age or in the age to come. We are in a series here at New City called The Hard Sayings of Jesus. And basically in this series, we're going through the Gospel of Matthew and looking at eight of some of the most difficult passages that tell us things about Jesus that are either hard to understand or they're hard to take. They might be easy to understand, but they're difficult to, to believe. And many of them are both at times hard to understand and hard to take. And today's is no different. And in many ways, today's passage um, often describing what in Christian circles is called the unforgivable sin is one of these passages that leaves many of us thinking, what is Jesus talking about? How could he be saying that he forgives every sin and then somehow this blasphemy, whatever that is, we'll get to it later, against the Spirit will not be forgiven and speaking against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. What is this unforgivable sin and what's going on here? And what I'd like to do today is, is try to provide you with an answer from what Jesus is saying in this passage. But I'd like to do it this way. I'd like to do it by reminding us all that actually this passage, as much as people focus on that last part and think about this unforgivable sin as the focus of the passage, I'd like to say that we'll get the answer to it, but we'll do it by seeing that this passage is actually primarily not about the unforgivable sin. But that this passage is primarily actually telling us about Jesus and who he is and what a difference it makes to understand what he's saying about himself in our lives in profoundly wonderful and life-changing ways. And so whether you are a Christian here today and you're wondering what's this unforgivable sin and have I committed it and could I and you maybe you're worried about it or whether you're not a Christian here today and you're wondering what this is all about and how could this be, that all of us together, I'm hoping and praying, will come to see how this passage is teaching us about Jesus and how in teaching us about Jesus, we can come to see who he is and how his message in this passage is one that promises incredible life in him. Incredible, dear, wonderful life in him. And so the way we're going to do it is this. Very briefly, we're going to look at three parts of this passage. One, that Jesus is stronger, verse 29. Then we're going to see Jesus is all or nothing, verse 30. And then Jesus is forgiving, verses 31 and 32. And in doing so, I believe at the end, we'll come to answer the question about the unforgivable sin. So first, Jesus is stronger, verse 29. Let me give you a little bit of quick context here. Uh, Jesus has just been doing a bunch of miracles, uh, healing people, doing all kinds of wonderful things, even healing a person or casting out a person's evil spirit that was dwelling in them. And he's been doing all these miracles in front of the people. It's been done in public. And the religious leaders have been accusing Jesus as a result of all these things they've seen like everybody else. They're saying that the only way that Jesus has been able to cast out these evil spirits is because Jesus is basically doing it in the power of Satan himself. That Jesus is doing it from an evil spiritual power in himself. That that's how he's casting out these evil spirits. And Jesus is saying, look, that doesn't even make logical sense. If you have you know, the, the realm of good, God and, and angels, and you have the realm of evil, Satan and his followers, demons or fallen angels, and Satan is casting out evil spirits from his own situation. He's dividing, it, in a sense, his house against itself. It's going to fall apart, Jesus is saying. That doesn't even make logical sense. That's not what's going on here. And so then Jesus says, oh, let me tell you what's happening in this situation. Let me tell you, especially you religious leaders who are accusing me, says Jesus, of being doing this in the power of, the, of Satan himself. Jesus says, let me tell you how I'm doing this. I'm doing this because, Jesus says, he is stronger. Look at verse 29. Verse 29 says this. 
How can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then, indeed, he may plunder his house. And Jesus is basically saying, yes, Satan is powerful. Yes, his fallen angels, demons are powerful. But Jesus says, I can come into that house and I can bind the strong man. And I can basically say, get out of my way. I'm coming to take what I want. And what Jesus wants is to take people who are enslaved to, to Satan, who, are, who have evil spirits dwelling in them. That's part of what he's coming to do. And he's saying, I'm strong enough to set Satan aside and basically bind him and take whoever I want and rescue them and free them out of the power of the enemy. That's what Jesus is claiming here. And this is a big claim. I mean, you're to, if you're here today, especially you're thinking, well, here I am in the midst of it. We still believe in these things? Uh, evil spirits, demons, angels, spiritual realm, unseen realm? Absolutely, yes. Absolutely. If you think I'm crazy, okay, that's all right. But the reality is that this is what Jesus is saying. And he's saying that he has the power to overcome all that. And I think what's amazing about this is that this is good news. Because this means that when you look around at this world right now, I think one of the easiest things to say about Christianity that's true, that the world can actually see by looking around, is that this world has problems. There's evil in this world. All you got to do is look around, watch the news, open your eyes. You'll see it all around you. And Jesus is saying that he has come and he is strong enough to do something about it. And that no one and nothing is stronger than him. And that he can even bind Satan himself, set him in a sense aside and say, I've come to take whatever I want and I come to take whoever I want and to rescue them and take them out of the domain of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of light because Jesus is stronger than anything and anyone else. And so the first thing we need to see today is that Jesus has the power over all things, over all beings, seen and unseen, and he has the power to rescue and free people out of slavery to the devil himself, to Satan, and bring those people from darkness and into his marvelous light. That is good news. Now, Jesus also has this to say, verse 30. Because he's stronger because he's greater than everybody else, because he is the king with all authority over heaven and earth and all things in it and is stronger than anybody else, Jesus then basically says in verse 30 that you're either with him or you're against him. He's all or nothing. Okay, point number two, Jesus is all or nothing. Look what he says, verse 30. Whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Jesus wants to make it abundantly clear that he is not somebody that you kind of add into your life. He's not an assistant. He's not like your helper. He's not there to simply be the person that you call on in your times of need and otherwise you just live your life as if you can manage it on your own. Jesus is saying, you're either with me or you're against me. You're all in or you're not. There's no middle ground. Now, maybe you're here and you're like, well, I'm trying to figure out who Jesus is and I'm not sure what I believe about him. Well, guess what? Here's the wonderful news for you. That when you read the story of Jesus' life and what he did and how he interacted with people, the people he was most patient with, the people that he spent the most time actually showing patient love and grace to are people who were trying to figure it out. People who were filled with doubts and filled with fears and struggling to know whether they could really believe in Jesus or not. He was most patient with them. And so hear that good news for you today that Jesus is patiently calling out to you and calling you to come and to learn about him and to investigate about him, to learn about who he is and what he has done. Read the word, spend time, wrestle with it, ask questions. He loves to engage with you in the midst of your doubts and your fears and your struggles. And so don't hear what I'm saying when Jesus says you're all there, all in or nothing as some way to say, get lost. That's not Jesus at all. He's saying, come and find me. Come and check it out. See what he is all about. What he's really saying here and mostly saying is saying to the religious leaders of his day and he's saying to us, those of us here who are calling ourselves Christians, he's saying, are you really in or not? Are you all in or not? Does your right life reflect a reality that you actually, as much as we're all a work in progress, are actually saying, yes, Jesus, I'm all in? 
Or is Jesus somebody that in one sense you expect to actually be rotating around your life? That you're the center and he kind of makes his round around you and you invite him in and help him ask for help once in a while. Or Jesus saying, are you realizing that his claims are so big and he is so great that he needs to be the center and you and I, we revolve around him. That daily life, not just Sunday mornings, but daily life, Every moment of every day is a day and a time and a place in which we are actually serving him and trying to love him and obey him and trust him and follow him. We work for him. We serve him. We live in our families, in our workplaces, in our playtimes, wherever we are in our schools, wherever we are, recognizing that Jesus is the center, not you, not me, but him. And we revolve around him because he is all or He is nothing. He cannot and will not be a sidekick in your life. Now, you might say, well, if I'm really honest about it, I'm a little scared to have Jesus at the center of my life. I'm a little bit worried. How can I know for sure that Jesus is someone I can trust to have at the center of my life? I feel like I should be at the center of my life and control everything and be there because then I can feel safe. And yet Jesus is trying to say to you, no, the only way you're ever going to feel truly safe and truly secure is actually when he is at the center, not you or not me. And the question is, well, how can you be sure that he's safe enough to do that? And this is the strange answer, okay? Jesus isn't safe. And you say, what are you talking about? Jesus isn't safe. Well, let me illustrate it this way. In this wonderful children's storybook, which you should probably read if you're an adult, if you've never read it anyways, because it's meant for everybody. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. C.S. Lewis writes about these four children who make their way into this magical world called Narnia. And they go through a wardrobe. It's a bit of a spoiler alert, but it's pretty early in the book. So, And they come into this land and they meet Uh, All kinds of wonderful people and creatures in this land, including animals who can talk. And two of them are Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. They're delightful. They're hilarious. And they're eating a dinner with Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. And uh, Mr. and Mrs. Beaver are telling them all about Aslan, who is the king of Narnia. He's the Christ figure, Jesus, in the book. And they say he's a great lion. He's the king of Narnia. And the children ask, is this lion Aslan safe? Is he tame? Is he a safe lion? Tame lion? And this is what the beavers say in response. Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. Now what are they saying? What are these beavers saying to us? They're saying this. Jesus is not someone you could manage. He's not someone who comes to your life to say, let me make you as comfortable as possible. What he says is, I've come to change your life and to make you a new person. And the reason you trust him is not because he's safe, but because he's good. Now, the question is, how do you know he's good? How do you know you can trust him with your life? And that question is found and answered in the last part of our passage this morning, point number three, and that is Jesus is forgiving. You know, a lot of people read verses 31 and 32 and a lot of talk about this unforgivable sin, and I promise you, I will get to it. But we need to understand that the main point of verses 31 and 32 is not about this unforgivable sin, but actually the main point of verses 31 and 32 is that Jesus is forgiving. Because look what it says. Therefore, this is Jesus speaking, therefore I tell you, Every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven people. Then he talks about blasphemy against the spirit. We'll get to that in a minute. And then he says in verse 32, and whoever speaks a word against the son of man will be forgiven. And then again, speaking word against the spirit, we'll get to that in a minute. But notice what he says first. Every sin, blasphemy, and word spoken against him, the son of man, Jesus, will be forgiven. And so the first and most important thing you need to understand about Jesus is that he is good and you can trust him because he is willing and able to forgive you every sin, every blasphemy. And blasphemy simply means that you're saying things that should be true about God, but you're saying them that they're true about somebody less than God, or you're saying things about other people that make them God when they should be credited to being God and only done by God. 
And Jesus says, you know, you can commit every sin. In other words, miss the mark in every way. That's what the word originally means, to miss the mark. Or you can do blasphemy. You can say things about God that isn't true. Or you can say things about other people as if they're God when it isn't true. It's only true about God. Or he says, you can even speak against the Son of Man. You can say things about Jesus that aren't true and that aren't real. And you could be mistaken in all kinds of ways about who he is. And he says, those will all be forgiven. Forgiven. Now, I don't know about you, but when people speak ill of me and speak wrong things about me, I struggle to forgive them. I know I should, okay? You say, you're a pastor, you should be forgiving. Yeah, well, I'm human, okay? I struggle, and I'm sure you would too. Listen to Jesus, the one who made this world, who sustains it all, and he says, every sin, blasphemy, and word spoken against him will be forgiven. That is incredibly good news. Because that means no matter who you are, where you're coming from, how religious or not you have been, you and I, we can be forgiven. And the proof is in Jesus himself, who not only says that you can be forgiven, but proves that you can be forgiven by ultimately having his life lead to a cross where he hangs and dies and suffers and experiences the judgment and the justice of God against sin that he himself pays in your and my place. And because he does that, those who trust in him can be completely 100% forgiven. No matter what you've done or where you've been. Now the question then is, okay, well then what about this unforgivable sin? I thought, you know, Jesus says, blasphemy against the spirit will not be forgiven. Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, verse 32, will not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. What is he saying? Is he contradicting himself here? And the answer is no. Let me try to explain it to you this way. What Jesus is making clear is this. There is a situation in the context of this passage that we need to understand. Jesus has just been making all these miracles happen. He's been casting out evil spirits from people. He's been saying that he is the promised king who would come and suffer and die for his people. That he is gentle and he is wonderful and he is forgiving. And then the religious leaders who have seen all of these things happen are basically saying about Jesus that he is Satan himself in one sense. And that he's working out of the power of the devil. And that he is evil in the flesh. In other words, they are standing there and they are attributing or they are saying what Jesus has just done wasn't done by the power of God, but it was done by the power of the devil. They're doing exactly the thing that Jesus is saying you cannot and must not do. And what that shows is the deeper sin here ultimately is the sin of constant stubborn unbelief. They refuse, seeing the evidence in front of them, they refuse to believe. They stubbornly, consistently hold back and do not accept the truth that's right in front of them that Jesus is God himself come in the, in the flesh and doing these things by the power of God, by the power of his spirit. And so Jesus is saying, the way that you cannot be forgiven is if you stubbornly refuse entirely throughout your life to you never ever turn to Jesus and repent. In other words, the unforgivable sin is unbelief all your life long. You can't be forgiven if you actually at some point in your life don't turn to Jesus and say, forgive me. You can't be forgiven if all your life you resist God and say, I'm not gonna go your way, I'm gonna do it my way. Then Jesus says, you won't be forgiven, you can't be. The unforgivable sin is simply that you refuse all your life to believe in Jesus. In which case there can't be forgiveness because it's only found in Jesus himself. And so Jesus in our passage today is making huge claims. I understand that. He's saying he's stronger than anybody and everything else. He's saying that you, you, if you're gonna really trust in him and say that you believe in him, that you call yourself a Christian, that you're gonna be all in because there is no halfway. And he's saying the reason you can do that, the reason you can trust him, the reason that you can know he's good is because he is the one who forgives everything. Everyone who comes to him in repentance and faith, who turns from their sin and says, Jesus, I trust in you and you alone to be the one who forgives me because you paid in my place and you are the one whose love and, your, and grace are the gift that I desperately need. And so because I trust in you, I know I can be forgiven. This is the wonderful good news of Christianity. 
as you heard in the testimonies a number of times today, no one comes to Jesus because we're saying, look how good I am. No one gets to God because we say, look at my performance and look at my record and aren't I worthy of coming before you? That's not Christianity. Christianity is coming to see how sinful we can be in and of ourselves, how far from what we ought to be we are, and to confess that to God and to admit it, and then to trust in Jesus as the one who's paid for those sins in our place. And as we trust in him, to find in him the new life and the new joy that is actually all on this day of Pentecost, a work of God's spirit. That the reason anybody believes, the reason anybody sees Jesus and all that he has done, the reason any of us actually come to trust in Jesus and believe in him and find our joy and delight in him is because God's spirit is working in us and graciously gives us this gift as an amazing gift of God's love and his grace to us. And so my prayer is that this would be the case for every single one of us, whoever we are here today. And I'd take a moment to pray that that might be the case. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that in your grace and in your mercy, by the power of your spirit, you would break down the stubborn walls that we've put up. I pray that you in your grace and your mercy would break through Father, there are people listening right now who are refusing, who in one sense are saying, I think I'd like to go my own way. I don't think I need to go your way. I don't think that you're big enough or good enough. I can manage on my own. I know enough. I'm enough. And I pray that you would be so loving and so gracious that you would smash that idea out of our hearts and our minds and show us how foolish it is because none of us, Father, none of us can make it on our own. I pray that you would do that in people's hearts today, not just people who don't call themselves Christians, but I pray for those of us who are like these religious leaders. We might have been in a church all our lives and we think we can manage on our own records. And we actually are missing your glory, and your grace. And we're just busy following rules that think we think will get us there. I pray that you would smash those perceptions in our hearts and our minds, that you would break them down. And as you break down those walls of our stubborn hearts, you would replace that stubbornness with a softness, a softness that reaches out to you in faith, that trusts in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and turns towards him as the only one who can pay the price that needs to be paid. Father, do that work in our hearts today. Change us. Make us into people who are humbled by your amazing grace and love and filled with the joy of that complete and whole forgiveness and grace. In Jesus' name. Amen.